Ladies and gentlemen, does the Bible teach that there are other gods other than Yahweh? And if so, isn't that polytheism? And what did Paul mean when he said that we wrestle against the rulers and cosmic powers? Do you really have a supernatural worldview? Just how supernatural is it? Well, my friend Dr. Michael Heiser, about five years ago, wrote a seminal book that has really helped change the worldview of many evangelical Christians when it comes to the supernatural. The book is called Unseen Realm, Re Recovering the Supernatural Worldview of the Bible. And we're going to talk about that book today and what's in it. Now, I got to warn you, your worldview may be rocked by listening or watching this uh, Hope One uh, live stream today because Dr. Heiser is uncovering things that I think have been sort of covered up in the evangelical world for so long. He has his PhD from the University of Wisconsin at Madison. Yeah, they have a PhD program there in the Hebrew Bible and Semitic languages. And uh, his website is drmsh.com for Dr. Michael S. Heiser, and we had him on the program about three weeks ago. We're bringing him back on. It's not just him this time, though. It's Norman the Pug Heiser. Here he is, ladies and gentlemen. Mike, how are you and Norman this morning? Yeah, Norman is doing fine. I don't know about me, but <laughs> <laughs> we'll find out in a few minutes. This is Norman's first appearance. So, this first appearance on the on the Hope One. Uh, live stream now norman is getting his first appearance but you have another pug in the house don't you yeah maury i mean maury's usually the one that sleeps and this one wants to take a nap now i guess i'm so comfortable but <laughs> if, if my wife shows up he'll snap to alert and just go really? berserk <laughs> <laughs> oh, well I, I uh, that's you use the word wife <laughs> there he is there, oh, you just used the word wife and he's looking around look at that <laughs> Now, how old is Norman the pug? He's about two. He's two, and yeah, and how about Maury? Five. How old is Maury? Maury's five. Yeah, uh, Maury's chill. Norman's the live wire, typically. He's the one you uh, have to watch. So I thought we we could bring him on to to as a visual aid when we talk about demons. But he, <laughs> he's pretty sedate right now. <laughs> he is. He's he's chilling right there, and our audience is loving. Yeah, he's chilling. Uh, he's, they're absolutely loving the pug right now, I can tell. So, uh, But what I want to do, Mike, and uh, if people haven't heard about you or your books yet, I hope today will be an awakening because uh, what you've done in Unseen Realm and sort of a summary of Unseen Realm is, is a shorter version of that called Supernatural. They can get yeah. either of those books. Their worldview is going to be rocked, but I, I really want to start by asking the kind of the the, the question from thirty thousand feet. So you know, before we look at the details of passages such as Psalm eighty-two, Genesis six, Deuteronomy thirty-two, we're going to get to those details. I want you to take five, ten minutes, however long it takes, mm -hmm. to sort of sort of give us an overview of the supernatural world, the unseen realm that the Bible teaches, all the way from pre-creation to eternity okay just take some time and do that give us an overview <laughs> it's a small order <laughs> that's it. That's so, it. i mean really you know the the unseen realm basically covers the gamut you know it, it covers all of that and so what i'll what i'll do here is i'm not gonna i'm not gonna drill down on anything i'm just gonna say stuff and and but i'm gonna tell your audience that everything i say you know is discussed in depth in the book and the dirty little secret of the book is that Mike never had an original thought. Okay, so what, what, the, what the book does is it takes decades, in some case a century or so, of peer-reviewed scholarship on all this stuff, and it distills it to something comprehensible and decipherable for people who aren't going to get degrees. And a lot of it, you're correct, you know, as you began, it doesn't filter down into the church. Uh, so there's there's sort of a an omission problem, and then some of it we're we're taught to not see. Okay, mm. so the way the academy talks about all this stuff, as opposed to what you hear in church, there's quite a bit uh, of a difference there. But you know, let not your heart be troubled. Our theology is intact. Our theology is biblical theology, but there's a whole backstory to it that really 
kind of puts it into place and gives it perspective, gives it depth and layering. So, you know, the biblical story is essentially a story of what God wants. What God wants is two things. God wants a family. He wants a human family that can interact with him, be with him. And he also wants partners. He wants the humans to be partners with him in enjoying the things that he does and in carrying out his will. Now, before God decided to create a human family, he already had one. Okay, so before creation, he has a family, the heavenly host, the, the beings of the supernatural world. They're referred to as sons, you know, children of God. They're around before creation. Job 38 tells us that very clearly. The sons of God are witnessing God creating the foundations of the earth. And then, of course, after that, we're going to get, you know, humans into the picture. So when God decides to create humans, this is Genesis 1.26. This is why we have plurals in Genesis 1.26. And it's also why it switches back to singulars in Genesis 1.27, the very next verse. You know, let us create humankind in our image, you know, as our image and our likeness. Our, our, these are, this is plural language. And typically this gets explained as the Trinity in the church. Well, the, there, there are a number of problems with that. One is if, the, if all the members of the Trinity are co-eternal and co-omniscient, God doesn't need to tell them anything, hmm. all right? And if you go to Genesis 11, this is the Babel incident. You know, it says the Lord, it's, it's the divine name Yahweh comes down you know, to earth to see what's going on at, at Babel. And then two verses later in verse seven, he says, let us go down and confuse their languages. Well, now, wait a minute. If this us language speaks of the Trinity and the Lord is already down there, wouldn't they be down there too? I mean, it, it just doesn't, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So we have dividing up the members of the Trinity. You know, we, we have, you know, co-eternal co-omniscient beings that seem to need to know information. It just doesn't make much sense. What you really have going on is God, you know, going into the room, as, as it were, and, and announcing to his heavenly host, I have a great idea. We're going to create humankind as our image and our likeness. And they're going to they're going to image me, which, you know, all the image of God is, is a representation. They're going to be my proxies, my my representatives. They're going to bear my name on earth and they're going to be part of part of, you know, our family. And they're going to participate with us in what we want to get done here. And it sounds like it, that heads for plural creation, but it actually doesn't. Because in the next verse, only God is creating. All, the language is always singular. You know, it, it reverts back. So God created them, you know, male and female, in his image, in his likeness. He created them. And it, it, it's singular. You say, well, why do we get singular and plural? It, it, it's a very simple idea. From the very beginning of human creation, the language here connects us and God and the members of the heavenly host. And in what way? Well, they're supposed to, they and us, the way they image God and the way we image God is supposed to operate symbiotically, as in heaven, so on earth. What happens here is supposed to reflect what happens there. We both have the same creator. We both have the same you know, boss, as it were. We are partners with the same God. And as they serve God there and represent him in the, in the supernatural world, that's what we're supposed to do here. And we're supposed to be doing the same thing for the same reasons for the same God. You know, and, you know we know the story. It, it gets messed up. It gets ruined and so on and so forth. But this is what God wanted from the very beginning. Humanity was created for sacred space. Unlike all the other ancient Near Eastern material where humans are icky, you know, like, well, we don't like, want them here with us. You know, this is why gods dwell on mountains and in gardens and remote areas. Because, you know, humans aren't supposed to be there. That is not the story of Genesis. Humans were created to be fit for sacred space. They, are, they are, were created to be fit to occupy the same room, as it were, as God and the rest of the heavenly host. But that isn't what happens. So what, as, as the story goes on, and this is a big difference in Unseen Realm and also in the Demon's Book, you have, <clears throat> I approach, it's going to sound really, really odd, but I approach the biblical story the way the Bible does, <laughs> as opposed to, again, you know, church tradition. 
You know, if, if you ask the average Christian, you know, why is the world such a mess? How'd this go wrong? What about cosmic evil? And you know, the answer you're going to get is, well, that's the fall. Yeah, that's the fall you've done your head. You know, haven't you read your Bible? And, well, yeah, I know it's the fall. But if you ask that, the same question to an Israelite who had a Bible and a second temple period, intertestamental period Jew, that's not the answer you would get. The answer is not the fall. The answer is, well, there's actually three reasons why the world just went haywire and why we have all this depravity why we have you know, supernatural you know, entities that are hostile to their creator. There's actually three reasons. And the first one is the fall. Let's think about what the fall does. The fall gives us a death problem. Okay, there is no more Eden. Humans have lost immortality. They are estranged from their father and their creator. From this point forward, everything dies. Hmm. Everything has the same destiny. You know, everything is going to wind up in the lap of the original rebel. Again, this the serpent, this the, the Satan figure. Everything is going to die. And so in one sense, he is now the master and owner of everything. He is, as the New Testament will call him later, the God of this world. Why? It's not because he's bigger and better than the true God. It's because everything dies. He owns it. But then you have another rebellion. You have the sons of God of Genesis 6. And we've been taught since the 4th century AD that there's nothing supernatural going on here. So let's ignore that, even though all of the ancients took it the same way. Um, that is, you know, the, the sons of God were, were divine beings. They come down. Yes, you know, that you have this cohabitation language with women. They produce the Nephilim. You know, and, and, you know which become lethal enemies to, to the Israelites. You know, we get all that strange stuff. But the real impact in Jewish thought of this is that what happens here leads to the proliferation and acceleration of death and destruction through depravity. You know, we can, we can unpack that a little bit later, but that's, that is why there's such a concern. Then there's a third rebellion, what happens at Babel. Okay, I was, an, I was a PhD student before I saw this verse, believe it or not, and I had read it dozens of times, but I never saw it. Because in PhD programs, they don't let you read English Bibles, for one thing. You know, you have to read primary texts. Mm -hmm. and, and we can read through Genesis 1, you know, Genesis 11 and, and ask, well, where, where are the demons? Like, where are the fallen gods? You know, where, where's all this bad stuff? And you're not going to see it. If you go to Deuteronomy 32, 8 and 9, you'll see it. It says, when the Most High divided up the nations, he divided them up. You know, he fixed their boundaries. You know, he divided them up according to the number of the sons of God. Hey, this is what the Dead Sea Scrolls read in Deuteronomy 32.8. A lot of your English translations will not have this. They'll have sons of Israel. He, he numbered them according to the sons of Israel. Well, that, that's a head scratcher because Israel didn't exist yet. <laughs> Israel's only right. going to be birthed after mm -hmm. Babel in response to what, you know, God judges humanity. He divorces himself from them. He assigns the nations to, the, to lesser members of the heavenly host you know, who, who become corrupt eventually. And we, we find that out from Psalm 82, because that's why they're being judged in Psalm 82. You know, the text actually means what it says. God is judging the other gods. Well, where did we get them? We got them at Deuteronomy 32. They're the sons of God who were appointed, allotted. Deuteronomy 4 uses the lang that language. Deuteronomy 29 uses that language of them. They're allotted to the nations. The nations are allotted to them. This is a punishment. God still wants them ruled justly because they're imagers. He's still interested in them because he makes a covenant with Israel or with Abraham to create Israel right after Babel. And in that covenant, he, he promises that the nations will be blessed through the, you know, the offspring of, of Abraham. So he's still interested. He wants them real justly, but that's not what happens. These entities, so chaos, they relate to the where we are. People listening to the broadcast, have you ever wondered? Why, when you're reading through Genesis 1 through 11, everybody knows who the true God is, and it's sort of relating to him, and he's relating to them, and then Babel happens, and, and now we've got Abraham. And if we look at Abraham's genealogy, and, and then we look at Terah and Abraham's brothers later at the end of the book of Joshua, they're idolaters. Hmm. Like, how did that happen? Where did idolatry come from? It just pops into this. No, it comes from this event. This is the origin of, of where we get these other gods and how everything just goes haywire. So if this is your supernatural worldview, it explains a lot of passages in the Bible about 
Israel being Yahweh's domain and everything else being under the dominion of something else that hates mm. Yahweh, that hates his people. It's mm. Israel against the nations. It's Yahweh against the gods. The whole rest of the story is framed by these three incidences, human depravity, human evil, idolatry, the whole bit. It's all framed in Genesis 1 through 11. Now, if, if this is your view, what do you expect of Messiah? Well, you expect Messiah to do more than correct the fall. Again, this is where we're at as in, in Christian theology. Jesus came to, so that we could have eternal life, you know, resurrection, and, and, you know, we could be brought back into the relationship with God. That's true. That's true. But what, but what we don't see is how the work of Christ fixes the other two problems, because we never see the other two problems. We're never taught about the rest of this stuff. You know, why is it? that we don't get any demon possessions in the Old Testament. And then when Jesus shows up, they're like everywhere. You know, like, where does that come from? Why would, why would a Jew expect the Messiah to have this as part of his profile, that he'd be able to cast out demons? There's nothing like that in the Old Testament, at least to our eye. I mean, why the expectation? I mean, there's all sorts of, of, of questions like this. What, you know, why does Paul not use the word demon hardly ever but instead, he uses principalities, powers, rulers, thrones. He uses all these geographical mm. rulership terms. Why does he do that? Mm. Because of Deuteronomy 32. Where does Daniel get his theology about prince, the prince of Persia, the prince of Greece in Daniel 10? Did Daniel just think that was kind of a cool, like, like he was like working for Marvel at that point or DC? Like, I got a great story. <laughs> Let's just invent that. No, no. He's getting it from Deuteronomy 32. That verse that we never see because we're not reading English translations that use the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, if you use the ESV, you're a little luckier here because it does that. Uh, you know, there are a few translations that, that the committees actually, again, had a, had a bit of a revelation. Why don't we include the Dead Sea Scrolls in, in what we translate here? But, you know, not all of us are that fortunate, you know. So we've got this whole cast of characters. My, the subtitle to the Demons book is what the Bible really says about the powers of darkness. The reason I titled it that was because not every, but not every power of darkness is a demon. Hmm. Okay, th there's, there's a whole different cast of characters. The same with the Angels book, what the Bible really says about the members of, the of God's heavenly host. Well, not every member of the heavenly host is an angel. Angel is a job description. Okay, so we've got this, this huge cast of characters. We've got a three-pronged problem. We've got a messianic expectation that's supposed to take care of all the mess, not just one, one part of it. And so we drift into the New Testament, and you would expect that this is what you see, and you do. But we just don't have our senses trained to see it. Well, let's do this, Mike. Let's, let's go into some of the details now. And I want to start, I want to go back to your, your demon question you just had. But before we do, one of the greatest insights, there's so many great insights in the book Unseen Realm and Supernatural that really help you understand why certain things occurred. I never understood the Tower of Babel till I read your book. Can you also make the connection to Pentecost? Yeah. Yeah. Because that was a brilliant connection I never yeah. saw. Go, go there first, and then we'll come back to demons okay. and Psalm 82. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, well, the, the work of Jesus naturally addresses the first two rebellions. But the third one, you know, Babel, we're all, we, we might see a, a glimmer of this if we recognize that, hey, Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. And, okay, mm -hmm. we, we get that much. But there's, there's a lot before we hit Paul. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. So at Pentecost, everybody's read this passage. I mean, how many sermons have you heard on Acts 2? Okay, mm -hmm. I mean, it just, you know, dozens and dozens of these. But the logic of, of what's going on escapes us. If you read Acts 2 carefully, yes, we have the coming of the Spirit. That's obvious. But if you read the dialogue, it's, you know, you, you come across a couple of terms in Acts 2 about, you know, the divided tongues, and they were bewildered, okay? Well, okay, they were, and, and I don't know what a divided tongue is, but now I'm just going to keep reading. Now, wait, you know, let, let's stop there. If you were looking at this in an interlinear, and you, you looked at the Greek word, and if you looked up or asked the question, hey, I wonder, I wonder where that Greek word occurs in the Greek Old Testament that the New Testament writers use 75% of the time. Mm -hmm. You would find that one that shows up in Genesis 11 at the Babel story, and the other one shows up, guess where? In Deuteronomy 32, 8 and 9. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. You know, again, so so the writer has linked the reader, the, the, the close reader, back to, you know, this rebellion. And then as you read in Acts chapter 2, you would see that they move from east to west. They start where the Jews are in exile in the east, and they start moving westward. And then when they hit the Mediterranean, of course, they split off, you know, into northern, north and south because it's, it's just water. Nobody's living there, okay? So we, we've got we've to go all the way back through. And you would realize that, you know, what's kind of interesting here is these place names cover all of the regions that you could put all of the nations from Genesis 10, which were the nations that were disinherited at Babel. You could put them all in all those regions. What a coincidence. You know, and then you keep reading in the book of Acts, and the Spirit directs people and has the gospel preached to all the places that are connected with Abraham and his descendants in the Old Testament. You've got Damascus. You've got Samaria. You know, e even, even south, the, the, the Ethiopian eunuch, why there? Because, again, we're not told this in, in biblical history, but there was a colony of Jews at Elephantine, Okay, in this area, Philip is trans after he speaks to the Ethiopian eunuch who's going to take the gospel down there to, to his countrymen. Then he's transported to Azotus. Like, what's that? It's Philistine territory. It's 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 part of the territory that wasn't quite, you know, gobbled up in the Davidic covenant. Every place that's to the Jew, the gospel goes. And then we get the conversion of Paul, because the gospel is the Jew first and then to the Gentile. And, and so Paul has as his mission to keep going throughout all of these regions, all of these places that are covered in the table of nations to take the gospel there. Why? Because the nations need to be brought back into the family. It's a reversal of the Babel curse, the Babel event. Mm -hmm. And what's really cool about it is that toward the end of his life, Paul is deeply concerned in Romans. He mentions this twice. He's deeply concerned about getting to Spain. Well, mm -hmm. what, what's Spain? Do they just, he, does he just like the food there? No, no. Spain is Old Testament Tarshish. It's the furthermost, the westernmost point that the table of nations geographically reaches, the disinherited nations. It's the only place that the gospel has not arrived at. And so Paul has this sense that I have to get to Spain to complete the job, to reclaim the nations. So there's actually a logic to Pentecost, to the chapters before Paul in the book of Acts, to Paul's ministry, you know, it, it, that, that relates directly to reclaiming the nations that were disinherited at Deuteronomy 32. You know, and, and in the Demons book, I have, a, I have a, a pretty lengthy quote from Plato. This, I think, is, is really worth pointing out. The Gentiles that Paul's talking to had the Deuteronomy 32 worldview in their head. Plato says exactly the same thing. This is hundreds of years, you know, BC. Mm. Mm. You know, that, that Paul would walk into a Gentile city and he, he, he would basically be saying to them, look, I understand that you know what's going on here. You, you know, you, we, have, we share the same worldview here, except that you think that your, your gods a lot of the gods to you that you should worship, you know, the bigger gods made the rules and you're supposed to worship this God and not that one or else they get angry and fight with each other. But they have this sense that, that we worship the gods we do because the gods allotted us to do that and, and we're not supposed to do anything else. So mm -hmm. Paul would say to them, look, I understand this. You're, you're fearful. You think that if you come over and embrace Jesus, that you're going to be in big trouble, that the mm -hmm. gods are going to come after you. Mm -hmm. And so what, what he basically says is, look, here's the story. The Most High, okay, the Most High became a man. He died on a cross so that you could be brought back to God. Your sins could be forgiven. He rose from the dead so that you'll have eternal life. And you need not fear because the Most High who gave these other gods their authority in a punishment back you know, after the flood, has now withdrawn that authority. He has nullified it. It's mm. over. You're not only allowed to come back to him, but he insists on it. Mm. And that's why I'm here. 
you need not fear the most high who is mightier than all these other ones. They're derivative I want, lesser. I just want our viewers here, Mike, to understand the significance of this, of the tapestry that you have exposed that the scriptures are. And that is at Babel, God disinherited the nations and assigned these lesser Elohim, these lesser gods to these other nations Mm -hmm. And then in Pentecost, which, by the way, this year is Sunday, May 31st, my friend Jack Hibbs at Calvary Chapel, Chino Hills, is going to start his uh, services back up that day. And a lot of other churches in California are going to do the same. That in Pentecost, God reinherits the nations. And mm -hmm. this is why Paul is so interested in going to the other nations. Yep. God says, go get them. Now go get him. So he's read this, friends. This story is so coherent when you let the Bible, when you interpret the Bible in the way somebody living in in the first century would would interpret it, or somebody living back in the day of say Psalm eighty two, which we're about to go here. This is why um, I think it's so important the work you're doing here, Mike, because it's really helping us understand what in in my mind, and I've been to seminary has been a, 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 a kind of cryptic path. What's the Tower of Babel all? I don't even get that. And you're yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm angry that they're building a building, you know? <laughs> yeah, what's the point? And um, we don't have time to cover all the details here because we want to get to questions here in about the next 10 or 15 minutes. But I do want to say this. Mike and I did a um, couple of podcasts on the Cross-Examined I Don't Have Enough Faith Being Atheist podcast in July of last year, 2019. I listened to the, to the one we did, uh, the first one we did, Mike, and you covered so much ground in that podcast that people need to go back and listen to that. Get the Cross-Examined app. You can listen to it. And we did two shows on this. But I do want to, Mike, go. I want to ask you one question and go to Psalm 82. Um, you mentioned earlier about there's not much in the Old Testament about demons. And then suddenly Jesus shows up and demons are everywhere. Can you unpack that? Why? I, I, what? what where did this come from? Why, why demons all of a sudden? Yeah. It's, it's hard for us to, to understand this because, again, we're not living in the first century. Right. Now, the, the, the quick answer to this, believe it or not, this is the quick answer, okay? The, the, the quick <laughs> answer to this, and I, I just did a, a podcast episode on my own podcast. I think it might actually be dropping this weekend on Psalm 91, okay? So, that was what we did last, a couple of weeks yeah, ago on this year, right, Psalm 91. Psalm yeah. 91 is, is crucial because it's part of a, of a second temple tradition, that psalm and, a, and, and some other ones, that held that David and Solomon had written songs, you know, psalms, a um, handful of them that dealt with casting out demons. And mm -hmm. Psalm 91 is part of that mix. And we don't see it because we don't realize that the terms that are translated like pestilence and plague and you know the arrows that fly by day these are all names of canite deities again right. the entities that that you know are, are hostile to god okay and so psalm 91 is part of a conquest of, of this so there's this whole tradition again that that we just can't detect with our eye because it's filtered out through translation that when you know jesus shows up there would be people who very naturally would say okay if this is really the son of David, then he ought to be able to do what David could do and what Solomon could do. You know, he should be able to cast out demons. So when he starts doing that, it's like game on. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, okay, I should probably pay attention now. You know, so it's, it's very natural that when he shows up, I mean, the, the hostile forces of darkness, they know who he is. And it's interesting when he's on Gentile territory, they refer to him as the son of the most high. Mm -hmm. When he's in Jewish, there ought to be worldview in there too, you know. He's just got these errors dominated by Gentiles to make the point, I'm not just the Messiah for the Jew. I'm here for all of it. Hey, Mike, say that point again because you – so you dropped out again. You said when he's in Gentile territory, they called him son of the most high. When he's in Jewish uh, territory, what did they, what did they call it? What did they say to Jesus? Son of, David. son of David. Son of David. Okay. All right. You'll have these episodes where the, the demons, you know, that he's confronting realize how to address him in different contexts. 
Mm -hmm. you know, again, it's this Deuteronomy 32 cosmic geography, you know, sort of thing working out. And, and, and so, you know, you, you, they know who he is. They know why he's there. It's like, well, you know, like Satan in, you know, in the temptation. He, he's not a, he's not a doofus. Okay. Like, like, okay, if he's here, then God must be at that silly, let's just restore Eden kind of nonsense. And, you know, so he, they know who he is and why he's there, but they don't know how God is going to get from point A to point B. They don't know the mechanism of the plan. And so Satan goes on a fishing expedition. You know, we talked mm -hmm. about Psalm 91. He mm -hmm. actually, Satan quotes an exorcistic Psalm at Jesus, again, to try to, to try to get some information, you know, to get Jesus to do something that he'll learn something about the plan. Jesus is having none of it. You know, it, it, there, there's just a lot of things that are sort of undercurrents, you know, to that episode. But, but when he shows up, yeah, this was a litmus test. This was a litmus test. The, well, the kingdom of darkness has been put on notice. Well, <laughs> the, the interesting thing is that he's Satan is quoting from yeah. a psalm that is supposed to be a psalm about, as you say, exercising demons. And yeah. that's the one he quotes. Yeah, that's Jesus. the one he quotes. And you also pointed this out, too, which is a, a great insight as well, that in 1 Corinthians, Paul says that if the spirits had known that yeah. What the plan was, they never would have crucified Lord Jesus. Lord. And, and that's why, I, 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 looking back at the Old Testament prophecies, you go, well, some of these prophecies are fairly specific, but you don't, it doesn't pinpoint every, no, every no, aspect of the plan. But if he no. had, then Satan wouldn't have encouraged the death of Jesus if he had known yeah. what the plan was. So, so when Satan, you know, quotes Psalm 91 and says, okay, you know, I'll take you up to the top of the temple here, throw yourself off, you know, because the Psalm says that these angels will guard you and protect you lest you dash your foot against a stone. And, I mean, you know, so he wants, it's essentially, okay, if you're the Messiah, let's see it. Let's see it. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. You know, and, and, and of course, if Jesus does this and angels protect him, or if he if he dies and then God has to raise him back, then Satan has learned something really important. Mm, mm. It doesn't do any good to kill him. Mm -hmm. Because God will just bring him back. Right. But that's exactly what needs to happen. Mm -hmm. And so Jesus, again, knows the plan. Satan does not. Mm. And again, he's having none of it. We're not putting any cards on the table. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> We've got to do this life because I do want to get to questions and, and our viewers have a lot of questions. Before we do, we have to go to Psalm 82 because this, this was your initial entree into discovering or recovering, as you say in the book, the true supernatural worldview of the Bible. Tell us what's in Psalm 82 that woke you up to this. And then over decades of research, it ultimately landed in the book Unseen Realm. Yeah, and, and also why Mike isn't a, a Mormon. <laughs> okay, good, good. Right. Throw so, that in there, too. <laughs> yeah, you know, in the introduction to, to Unseen Realm, I relate, you know, my own epiphany. Again, I, you know, I, I was in church, you know, killing before church. And there was a guy in church who was in the Hebrew department with me. And as I say in the book, I don't remember what the conversation was about, but I'll never forget the way it ended because it was life changing. He he just handed me his the Hebrew Bible and said it was open to Psalm 82. And he said, you need to read Psalm 82, you know, in Hebrew. And the first verse is just, you know, it left me thunderstruck because it says Elohim that El. Elohim, capital G-O-D. Again, the, the reason is that the Nitzav is a singular verb form, so it's one. Capital G-O-D. God takes his stand in the divine council. And then the next line in the same verse is the care of Elohim Yishpot. In the midst of the Elohim, he passes judgment. Hmm. Now, it can't be the Trinity because if you read verses two through five, the other Elohim are really crummy guys. So, okay. <laughs> That's right. They can't be part of the Trinity. They, yet. they are they are yeah. under judgment. Okay. And you can't be in the midst of one. So we've got a group of Elohim here. And if you go down to verse six, you know, the speaker, God says, I said to all of you, you know, per, plural pronoun, you are gods. 
Uh, you are Elohim, all of you, sons, plural, of the Most High. But nevertheless, you're going to die like men. Okay, so you, there's no escape. You have God speaking, passing judgment in a council meeting over a group of gods. Mm. And I looked at that and I thought, well, that looks like a pantheon. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, I was not a, a Bible newbie. I'm, I'm in a doctoral program in Hebrew studies. By that point, I have two master's degrees. I have taught at the Bible college level for five years. I've been to Bible college. I've been to seminary. It's like, how in the world could I never have seen that before? I, and I felt the same way when I hit Deuteronomy 32.8, you know, in, mm -hmm. in the week that, you know, subsequent. Like, how in the world could I have never seen this? And it, it, it rattled me in the sense that, I mean, what, what do I say to this? You know, what, like, what, do, what do we got here? But then again, providentially, I also had another thought that was, you know, I'll bet Jesus knew that verse. Mm -hmm. you know, I'll bet Paul knew it. I bet the New Testament writers knew it. And somehow the theology that they articulate has to be consistent with this. I just, I just can't see how. And then I went off into commentaries, you know, I, my, my trusted evangelical sources, which said either nothing about it, or they just said, oh, the Elohim here are just people. They're just mm. Israelite judges. Right. You know, well, that's comforting because when I flip a few pages and go to Psalm 89, and Psalm 82 has the sons of the Most High as Elohim. Psalm, you know, there's only one Most High, they're sons of God, okay? And then you go to Psalm 89. You have the sons of God in council. You have the same council language as in Psalm 82, but the council's in the skies. Okay, it's in the heavens. This is a this is a supernatural council. You know, the last time I looked at my Bible, there aren't a bunch of Israelite elders floating around the sky uh -huh. ruling the nation. I mean, it was just absurd. You know, and so I wasn't getting any help. And the critics love this because now they can take Psalm 82 and argue. Oh, the Israelites, they were polytheists originally, and now they've evolved to the wonders of monotheism. Mm -hmm. Now, this is what you get in this evolutionary trajectory. <clears throat> which you reject. Yeah. Which I reject, you know, because yeah. that actually became a focus point of my dissertation. Because as I as I got into this to try to, to, try to noodle this problem, I, I, I saw things, and I actually counted them. I, I have a published article on this in the Tyndale Bulletin that's available online. It's available on the web, where you've got over 160 instances in the Dead Sea Scrolls, which are well past the era of Isaiah when Israel broke through to the glories of monotheism, okay? This is hundreds of years later, okay? At the Dead Sea Scrolls, you've got over 160 references to plural Elohim and plural mm -hmm. Elohim and sons of God. In, 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 in a dozen places, it's divine council scenes. So somebody didn't get the memo. You know, like if this is polytheism, somebody didn't get the memo. And so I, I thought, this is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. This is this is inconsistent, inconsistent, it's incoherent. There must be an answer. And eventually, you know, I, I, I you know, again, I'd love to say I just figured it out because I'm, I'm just so smart. But honestly, I, I have to say that what I know and what I discovered, I was shown. I mean, honestly, I was just shown. I have a whole series of providential things that just, just, planted me at the right place at the right time to hear hear the right paper at a conference to to stumble into a book you know or a journal article i mean I, that's just the way it worked and well, so mikey you you've got to draw a distinction for our viewers yeah. then what elohim uh, actually means what the plural elohim are yeah mm -hmm. it's all it is is a term you would use as a label for any resident of the spiritual world Okay. This is why the biblical writers use Elohim of lots of things that aren't the God of Israel. It has nothing to do with a unique set of attributes. Mm -hmm. okay? This is not polytheism. There is only one Yahweh. There is none like him. Ontologically, okay, there is none like him. He is species unique. Yahweh is an Elohim, but no other Elohim or Yahweh. Has mm -hmm. nothing, the term itself has nothing to do with attributes. All it is is it's like it's a word like spirits. Okay, you're a member of the of the supernatural spiritual world. This is why the human dead are referred to as Elohim. This is why the gods of the nations are Elohim. This is why the Shadim of Deuteronomy 32, 17, typically translated demons, they're called Elohim. It's not because they're at the same level as the God of the Bible.
There's only one of those. You know, no Israelite would think my dear departed five-year-old is now on an ontological par with the God of Israel. But, well, they're both Elohim now. No, nobody's thinking that. And this is the error of Mormonism. Mormonism takes the plurality of Elohim in Psalm 82 and assumes they're all interchangeable, that there is no ontological distinction at all. Mm -hmm. That's why Satan and God and Satan and Jesus are in Mormonism. Mm -hmm. Okay, that is a failure to note that the term A has nothing to do with a unique set of attributes, and B, the attributes that Yahweh has in other passages are specifically denied to other Elohim, all other Elohim. Mm. So you're only getting part of the picture if you're talking to a Mormon, and, and this is a fundamental error that, that they make. Well, you, you point out in the book Unseen Realm that there are at least five or six different ways, or I should say, different spiritual entities to which the term Elohim could apply, other than Yahweh himself. Who, who are the others? There's the, Elohim. there's the deceased human dead in 1 Samuel 28, 13. You know, Sam, the spirit of Samuel you know, shows up. He's an Elohim. He's, an, he's right. called an Elohim. You know, right. Saul asks the medium, what do you see? She says, I see an Elohim coming up out of the ground. All right. Okay. You get the gods of the nations like Chemosh of Moab. They're called Elohim. Well, mm -hmm. obviously a biblical writer isn't going to think it's the same as Yahweh. Would Baal be considered an Elohim, Mike? What, what was that? Would Baal be considered an Elohim? Yes. Any, any spiritual being is an Elohim. Elohim okay. is just like, like Rukhot, spirits. This mm -hmm. is a label you're going to, I'm going to stick on you because you're a member by nature of the disembodied spiritual world. Mm -hmm. Now, we could... We could go on for hours on this, and Mike's book goes into great detail. I know there's a lot of questions that have been generated by this shocking discussion for some of you. And as I say, I've been to seminary, and I never heard this, okay? And, but when you look at the text, this is what the text says. The question is, how do we interpret the text? And so I want to bring Jorge on, because Jorge, I know we have a list of questions from our viewers. There's viewers on YouTube. There's viewers on Facebook. Uh, there may be viewers on the app and our website. If you want to ask a question, type the big block letters, capital letters question, and then give a very short, succinct question in complete English. We'll see if we can get to it. Go ahead, Jorge. Bring. Well, take it away. Thanks, everybody. We're actually on uh, Dr. Heiser's page, too, and we have a bunch of people watching there. Right. And since we don't have a monitor there, you guys can make your way either to the Frank Turek page or the Cross Examine page and ask your questions there. First one, uh, Carmel asks, uh, can you give your credentials for, for people who don't know you, Mike? Because I know this is shocking. So go ahead on and lay it out for them. Yeah, I, I have a PhD in Hebrew Bible and Semitic languages from the University of Wisconsin at Madison. By the way, the Hebrew program is now part of the classics program there. It's not a self-standing program anymore. I have a master's degree in ancient history with specializations in Egyptology and uh, Canaan, Syria, Palestine from the University of Pennsylvania. Um, I have another master's degree from UW Madison, also in Hebrew studies. Um, you know, I went to Bible college, went to seminary, but yeah, you know, I, I, I have been, I have been from fundamentalism to the UW Madison. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I, just, I, I, I know all the conversations that, that, that can happen. Uh, UW Madison is the Berkeley of the Midwest and it deserves that reputation, but it had, it has a long standing history of being friendly, uh, to evangelicals. In, uh, you know, for Hebrew studies. When I was a, a grad student there, every graduate student was a Christian, was a believer. Mm. Every one of them. It's different for undergrads. You know, you had a lot of, a lot of Jewish students there. But it was a good environment, you know, at, at least as far as, you know, its acceptance. You know, they knew who we were. We knew who they were, that, that kind of thing. They just asked that you did good work. You know, no, nobody forced anything on you there. But and to my advisor's credit, he let me do a dissertation that ran directly against the mainstream of biblical scholarship because everybody who's non-confessional and and I I'm I'm sad to say some evangelical bought into the question yeah, biblical some of them were polytheists that had to discover monotheism mm. this evolutionary trajectory I don't buy it for a minute I think it is internally incoherent it implodes it's based on circular reasoning 
But on the other side, we do a great disservice to the, to the serious Bible-believing community when we camouflage what's in the text through either our translations or our tradition. Because I'll guarantee you, there are people out there in the wild world of the internet and YouTube that know this material well, and they love to pounce on Christians, knowing that they've never heard this stuff, and mm -hmm. they're going to use it to destroy their faith. Mm -hmm. I get emails like that every week. Mm -hmm. Okay, This is part of why I do what I do. You do not need to fear your Bible. Okay, you're only getting part of the story. You're getting filtered and stilted information. You're being told you can only think one way about the data, and that is demonstrably incoherent and not true. In fact, Mike, let me say that your book, in, in a certain respect, sort of gives the box top to the puzzle that many mm -hmm. see the Bible as. Once mm -hmm. you get the box top, when you mm -hmm. realize, say, there's a connection between, say, Babel and Pentecost, you go, Ah, that box top is very healthy. Believe it or not, okay, you might want to be sitting down for this, this profound statement that's going to come. <laughs> Maybe I should go get Norman so he can take credit for it. <laughs> that's right. The Norman. Bible is supposed to make sense. Uh -huh. mm. It's supposed mm. to make sense. But, but we, because we don't read it, through the eyes of an ancient Israelite when we're in the Old Testament or the eyes of a first century Jew. Because we don't read it that way. Instead, we read it like a textbook of bullet points and self-help guide or something like that. Mm -hmm. we, we know lots of parts of it, but we have, no, we have no framework into which all of that data fits. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm trying to do in Unseen Realm is I'm trying to convince people, you know, I want the Israelite living in your head. I want the first century Jew living in your head. If you do that, if you commit to reading it like an ancient person, you set aside your denominational distinctives, you set aside your traditions, okay? Read it like the original ancient people would read it. You will be reading your Bible again for the first time. You will not be able to unsee what you see. And mm. it, it will help you put the pieces somewhere in place and see how they connect to each other. See, you'll be able to see threads of thought from Genesis to Revelation. It'll start to make sense for you. And I can say that because that's what it did for me. Again, I was mm -hmm. not a Bible newbie when I had my Psalm 82 moment. Mm -hmm. and, and this simple, but, but at the time, scary decision that, I'm just going to jump in here. I'm going to I'm going to pretend I'm an Israelite. I'm going to pretend I'm a first century Jew. I'm just going to look at the text the way they looked at it and, and let the chips fall. Because I believe that Paul and Jesus and the other New Testament writers did that. And I know where they came out. OK, mm -hmm. it'll I'll be OK. It's going to be scary, but I'll be OK. And and I it all happened to me. I, you know, I was reading my Bible again for the first time. Like I, I can't believe you know, what I, what I never saw. And, and that was out of that experience was, was what would become Unseen Realm because I can remember sitting in the Memorial Library one day, just enjoying it. I mean, how many people actually get to enjoy their dissertation? <laughs> you know, but I mean, I, the thought hit me that, you know, the average Christian who really cares about scripture, they will never see 95% of this. Mm -hmm. They'll never see it. Mm -hmm. They'll never have the thrill of, of like all this stuff. And I, and I thought, you know, I, that's what I should do. I, I think I can do that. I think I can take this stuff and put it into a readable, comprehensible form and then, you know, help people move down this path that I, I was moving on. And the summary of that is called a book called Supernatural. So if you don't want to go through 300 plus pages of Unseen Realm, Get but, natural, and then you can go to unseen realm. I, there's a question up here that I want you to give, just give a short answer to this, if you can, Mike. About and then demons. We're going to talk about demons in a couple of weeks. That's another book. But uh, people keep asking, where are you getting this uh, this Dead Sea Scrolls uh, translation? What Bible would you recommend people get so they can get the Dead yeah. Sea Scroll perspective? All right, I will. I will. My disclaimer here is that there is no perfect translation. All right. they all, they're all good, but they all have problems. You know? uh -huh. 
So if, you're, if Deuteronomy 32.8 ESV has incorporated the Dead Sea Scrolls into Deuteronomy 32.8 and also verse 43, um, because you have the same omission there about the Elohim in verse 43 that you do in, in verse 8. Mm -hmm. But ESV is right on top of this, this data. That is the reading of the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's the oldest form of the Hebrew text we have, and they include it in their translation. So good, good for them. NS, NRSV will have it, um, NLT will, will translate it something like angels of God. So they're, they're tracking on it. Mm -hmm. that the so, you know, those are three that come to mind immediately. Um, okay. you know, we're not without English translations where the committee that produced them have made choices like this, where, where the choices need to be made. So those All are right. three. Go ahead, Jorge. What else we got? I got one here. In what way do believers today interact or fight with the powers of darkness? Are we instructed to do it in a you know, particular way? We are. We actually are. Okay. This is, this is another one I, I would need Norman for because this will be deeply profound. <laughs> spiritual warfare. You could, you could write the words warfare on a piece of paper, put the equal sign, and then write great commission. Okay. Mm. That is spiritual warfare. You have to ask yourself a simple question. What do the powers of darkness fear? They don't fear you shouting at them. They don't fear loud music that's Christian music. They don't fear, you know, you going and, you know, in the, in, the, in the rooms in your houses. And I mean, if you want to do that stuff, you know, it, it's not a bad thing, but this is not what they fear. What they fear is the loss of their status and their kingdom and eventually their own existence. And we talked about the Deuteronomy 32 worldview, that, that the reclaiming of the nations began at Pentecost and progressed through the ministry of Paul. And Jesus gave us the Great Commission. Well, why? Why did he do that? Well, Paul in Romans 9 and 11 links the, quote, fullness of the Gentiles, his ministry, with the return of the Lord, which includes the day of the Lord, which includes the destruction of the powers of darkness that we read about in Psalm 82. In an unseen realm, I, I show how all these things are connected. But the powers of darkness, they, I, I also get this question. Do they think they can beat God? Well, no, they don't. They know who God is, but it, dep it depends how you define victory. Okay, if you define victory as keeping the great commission in other words keeping the fullness of the gentiles away you keep kicking that can down the road so that it never happens hmm. then they're not going to get destroyed their authority has been nullified it has been removed but they are hanging on to their turf they hate you they hate god so the game plan is really simple keep you from accomplishing the great commission Mm -hmm. keep you from discipling people mm. because the longer we can forestall that we get to stick around mm -hmm. so that is what they fear so if you want to do something in the name of spiritual warfare that they fear go witness to your neighbor amen don't shout at the demon go witness to your neighbor okay do something that sounds like the great commission you know jesus and we think the great commission is matthew 28 19 and 20. there's a verse before that it's verse 18. I've mastered that much math, Frank. <laughs> <laughs> All authority has been given unto me in heaven and on earth. Amen. Okay. Well, who, who had authority before that state? Mm. The disinherited gods and, you know, over the nations. Mm, mm, mm. That's what had authority. That has been removed. <clears throat> okay. So now is the beginning of your end. So this mm. is how the, the Jesus would not come back in a time machine. Uh, you know, instead of that great commission, I should have said this. No, I mean he's got it correct. <laughs> he wouldn't amend it. <laughs> this is what we're supposed to do. Excellent. I got one more before I give it back to Frank. In this one, he asks, "Have you had any supernatural experiences that have influenced the writings of these books? Uh, have you dealt, you know, of evidence, you know?" Things like demonic possession, evil spirit attacks, and the like. Uh, are you aware of these things? And I know 
a little bit uh, because of your podcast about mm -hmm. uh, Fern and, and Audrey. Yeah. If it, so just expand on that a little bit before we yeah, close I, the show. I, I have not had anything direct that I would call, you know, a, a spiritual attack or some like paranormal experience or anything like that. And, I, and direct is an important term, you know, because the context here is like some kind of attack or anything. Mm -hmm. Or, or like, you know, a Joseph Smith experience. You know, no, 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 no angel came and dictated unseen realm for me. I, I think. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and, and nothing like that. You know, I, I know people though who, who minister to people who um, are ritually abused. You know, I've known people who've had such encounters again, that, and they don't make it the centerpiece of what they do or their identity. It's just, hey, this happens. You know. And I, you know, I believe that it, it, of course it happens. It happened in the New Testament, you know, it, it, you know, it's not like the normative Christian experience, but it's out there. Now I will say, you know, that, that I feel like I was, I was helped. Okay. I would use the word helped, mm. but I, I had no, you know, visionary experience or anything like that. Um, I mean, I could describe a particular episode where I think I was helped because I don't know. I, I think, I think God had pity on me at a few points in my dissertation where he had to, he had to give me some help, but you know, we don't need to go there unless you want to. I mean, I can tell you a story, but you know, I don't know if you have any other questions. Well, Mike, I have a question because we always end uh, this show because it's about hope. It's the hope one show we're giving, we're trying to give people hope uh, during this lockdown. Um, as you look at the grand view of the Bible, where really is our hope? Our hope is in the accomplished, historically rooted work of Jesus, and that includes the resurrection and the ascension. You know, I, I, I think we're, we're heading into days where the enemies of all that are actually going to be using a resistance to believers believing in the supernatural world against us. Mm. Okay, we could we could have a, a whole show on that and, and elaborate on that. But I think our, our hope is to realize that there is a God that is a completely coherent idea. All of these other ideas about the spiritual world, all that the Bible teaches about us, other spiritual beings, are derivative of the one fundamental proposition that there is a God. And that is sound. It has been attacked for millennia and it's still here. And it's not just on life support. Mm -hmm. It's here in a powerful way. Mm -hmm. It ain't going away. Mm -hmm. So I think we can be confident in, in God, in, in who Jesus is, what he did, you know, rooted in, 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 in the facts of real history. And, you know, that secures our eternal destiny. If those things are true, this world is not our home mm -hmm. and we have no reason to fear. Mm. Look at those two uh, websites, friends, as you're, we're wrapping up the show here at the bottom of your screen. D-R-M-S-H for Dr. Michael S. Heiser.com. Also, you can go to M-I-Q-L-A-T.org for all of Dr. Heiser's work. He has a podcast called The Naked Bible Podcast. Avail yourself of that. And don't forget the two shows that we did on the I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist podcast in July on this topic. We've only scratched the surface here. And there's a lot more in the book, obviously, Unseen Realm, supernatural and let me recommend one other book that will be very helpful to you particularly if you're a new believer and if you even if you're not it's called what does god want mm -hmm. by dr michael heiser very simple to understand you can give it to anybody and it'll give you some more meat on the bones of these ideas that may have been new ideas to you today even though they've been in the scriptures forever mike thanks so much for being on the show norman couldn't stick with you very long could he no, no, he, he heard mom at the door. <laughs> <laughs> so Norman is Norman has mommy issues. <laughs> okay. But you're going to come back in the, in the next couple of weeks, and we're going to do more of this. Is that all right? I'll, I'll, I'll bring Maury that time. You, you may never see him because he'll be asleep the whole time. <laughs> okay. All right. That's good. Maury the pug next time. All right, friends, don't forget, tomorrow, Dr. Sean McDowell, who did his dissertation on the fate of the apostles, will tell us, how the apostles handled pain and suffering. So don't miss tomorrow's show. And then on Monday, we'll have his father, Josh McDowell, on. So hope to see you guys here on Hope One next time. Thanks, gentlemen. Bye-bye.